So let's talk about this first one. Present, <coughs> how to present your product to chefs. This is very, very important, very critical. So chefs are a different breed of people, just like farmers. Okay, and, and I think that each of you kind of needs to understand how each other works, how you think, um, if you're going to be able to work together. Okay, so there's some things with chefs. First of all, when you're first going to make contact with a chef, do not walk in at noon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you'd be amazed how many people have come into my restaurants when I was a chef in industry, and it's noon, and they're like, hey, I'd like to show you my product. You know, and, and not just you know, local purveyors, but... You know, people from big companies like Cisco and GFS, you know, their salesmen come in at noon. It's like, there's the door, buddy. Yeah. And don't come back. Seriously, don't come back. Because if you're that much out of touch with what I'm doing and you're walking in my restaurant at noon or at the dinner hour, I don't want to talk to you ever again. Let's send somebody else. Okay, so that's number one. Um, you know, do, do a bit of research before you go and approach these people. You know, the... The internet's fantastic. You can find out anything you want to know. So find out a little bit about, about their restaurant. What are they doing? You know, and if they're not serving any local product, well, why? And, and is there somewhere that you could fit in there? You know, when I first started talking to chefs in, in, in our area that weren't using any local product, I would say to them, look, put one thing on your menu. If you put 10 more pounds, if you buy 10 pounds of carrots this year that are local and put them on your menu, we've won. Right? So don't try and go in and go, hey, look, you know, you got to change your whole restaurant. You know, go in with a, a good solid idea, knowing what they're doing already and seeing where you can fit in with that. Okay? You know, turn that down, buddy. Um, you know, let's kind of skip here a little bit. We'll come back, but, you know, these niche markets. You know, I think it's very important that this is great, this conference, because all of you are here. Uh, there needs to be somebody taking s everybody's email address, I would hope that they have a list like that, and create a listserv so that all of you can start communicating with each other. You know, um, I've always thought, wouldn't it be awesome if the farmers actually started talking to each other about what they're growing and that everybody doesn't grow the same thing? Right? You know, we, when you go to the farmer's market, there's 10 stalls and everybody's selling carrots. Now, you know, one guy's carrots is better than the other guy's and, and so on, right? But wouldn't it be awesome if you could actually go, okay, my property is great for growing carrots, my property is great for growing beets, and start working together like that so that, you know, we're creating a market where everybody has a share. You know, I mean, competition's great, but wouldn't it be cool if we could kind of do something like that? But again, niche markets, you know, the berries, somebody's talking about berries, um, that's starting to be popular now, people making local fruit juices, you know? Um, there's a, a great place in the Okanagan doing that. Um, <coughs> So when you're, you know, if you're new and you're starting on a farm and you're wanting to get into restaurants, find out what's not being produced for a start, you know, and then, and, 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 and plant that. But also, have some ideas of what you could do with that product. So when you go and present it to a chef, you know, maybe have something of you know, value out of product that you've, you've created. Go, hey, look, I've got this amazing juice that I've created. What could you do with it? You know, could you make it into a sauce? Could you put it on your cocktail menu? Uh, could it just be a non-alcoholic beverage, that kind of thing. So I think that if you go in with some ideas with these guys, they'll be open-minded to it, right? But make sure, if you're going to go in and present it to these guys, that whatever you have is freaking awesome. It's got to be. Because chefs are picky, very picky. It's their job to be picky, right? They want the best quality, especially if they're going to be paying primo dollar for it. It had better be good, and it better be good all the time. You know, and we're, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So again, you know, presenting your, your things to chefs, have a unique product, have an amazing product. Um, <coughs> make sure that that product's going to be available for them, okay? There is nothing worse. I write my menu. I put that product on my menu because I know I can get it. I've printed my menus. I've invested money in this, right? And two weeks later, oh, sorry, it's, it's all gone. It's sold out. Like, what are you talking about? Like, I just... You know, um, a good example of that is uh, when a farmer we were dealing with had committed to selling us tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes. Okay, so this is in the late fall. Yeah, I can get you through till November, no problem. Okay, perfect. Put them on the menu, right? Menus are printed. Then this other event came up, and these people wanted some tomatoes. Don't oh yeah, we got tomatoes here. We'll donate all these a couple hundred pounds of tomatoes. 
That was fantastic. It was very nice of them to do that. But now I have no tomatoes for my menu, right? Like, you can't do that. It, it, if you're going to promise, make sure you can fulfill that promise. Now, there's exceptions. There's crop failures and so on. And that's an exception. That's fair enough, right? Yeah. That can go both ways, too, in terms of the farmer producing something. For sure. And all of a sudden, uh, there's no interest. Uh, and I know that that happens. Yeah. Uh, one of our largest producers here cut a few fields of Safeway. And the first delivery he made with his potatoes, they cut the order in half. And just uh, bartering him down. And he just said, you guys will all go and I'll sell my, I'll give them away because yeah. I'll sell them to you. He was so angry. It's a huge issue. It's a huge problem. Five acres of potatoes he, ate, he had grown for yeah. them and, and they decided that. It's something I'm going to talk about in the chef's workshop that I'm going to do, you know, because it does go both ways. Um, <clears throat> I was just talking to somebody a little while ago about this, that, you know, on the island, there was a real hesitation from the farmers at first, you know because they were afraid that these chefs were going to get together and form buying groups. Like, that's just the worst, that's the last thing any farmer wants to hear, right? And it happened to them over there that these grocery chains started going, oh, yeah, we'll get on this local food market thing, right? Like, this is what people want for sure. And so they'd go to a farm and go, okay, hey, great, you know, you plant that whole field of lettuce, and we'll buy it for X amount of dollars, right? Well, then they go down the road to another farmer and go, well, what will you give it to me for? right, and, and play on each other. And so these people are committed, they've planted their fields, now the grocery store, oh yeah, sorry, don't need that anymore, right? And that really left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, obviously, like this is, this is your guys' livelihoods, right? So there needs to be a yeah, real... If they're gonna do that, they should do it publicly, just like the, mm -hmm. the flower auctions do. They actually get together, and then it is an auction, it's right. like bidding and whatever, but you're doing it in front of everybody, there's no backstabbing, and everybody knows, yeah. you know, yeah, the product might be better this week and, you know, somebody else is better next, but yeah, it, they're, they're not backstabbing each other. And it, it happens, but there needs to be that level of trust. And I think that, you know, no, um, this is why I think a, a direct relationship with a chef and a farmer is far better than yeah. a big grocery store's chain who really doesn't give a shit, yeah. right? Like, they're all about just the bottom line, and I don't care if I'm going to screw this farmer over. It doesn't matter to me because I'll get it from anywhere I want. Pardon me? And they have 100 choices. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So again, this is, this is really where developing these relationships and trust, and it takes time. Absolutely, it takes time. But that needs to happen. And it's a lot easier to do that on a one-to-one -one level, you know. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So again, presenting chefs, connecting with chefs. You know, the best way, honestly, door-to-door. You know, go in, but I mean, again, make time to uh, make an appointment with them. Don't, cold calling is not necessarily the best idea. You know, make sure that they know you're coming, what you're about. It's easy enough to get somebody's email address. You know, send them a product list of what you have. Set up a time to go and meet them. Take some of that product in and, and let them taste it. Let them see what it's all about. Okay. Um, consistency. Okay, like delivery times. Again, if you're going to deliver, don't deliver at noon. So, you know, you know, you've made this deal with the chef. It's all good. You're going to get your product into their restaurant. But make sure that, you know, you're, you're not coming in at noon. You're not coming in at dinner time. That you set up what time is good for them and try and, and work that out, right? Try your best to make sure that that delivery time is consistent and that you're there and that you have the product. You know, when, as a chef, we're under really, really strict timelines. You know, we've got our prep schedules. You know, we know when our product's coming in. We know how much labor we have in. We know how many people we're going to have in for lunch. If that product doesn't arrive, we're screwed. We're screwed. And they get pissed off. And, you know, one, depends on the chef, but, you know, one bad experience, they'll go find somebody else. They will. Because it is, you know, I mean... I tend to give people a chance and give them a break, you know, but, you know, you do that to me two or three times, I can't afford to do that. This is my business, my livelihood. You know, you, you can imagine that we, I have a party at lunch for 30 and I have a set menu for them. They know exactly what they're getting and all of a sudden I don't have that product, you know. Really, really important that, that the product gets there consistently, right, and the product is, is good. Um, so niche markets, 
you know, again, do your research, especially if you're new, you know, before you get into something, find out what's not out there, right? Find out what's not out there and fill that niche. Be creative. You know, again, the internet is a fantastic tool. You can find out anything you want these days, right? Um, <coughs> value added, okay? In that niche market is value added stuff, okay? Value added is, this is what's going to make your farm profitable, okay? I think that this is something that really needs to happen now, especially is thinking outside of the box, you know? Um, we're in a real dire strait right now. Everybody knows that the average age of farmers is, what, 55 and up. Yeah, there you go, 62 and up, right? Absolutely. That's a real problem because in the next 10 years, <laughs> you guys are going to want to retire, you know, or people are going to yeah. start dying. Like, yeah. this is reality. Yeah. So what needs to start happening now is that these farms that are operating, what's that? Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Well, they do. How... If they can, and but but what I'm seeing is that these kids don't want to do it. They've grown up in this farm. They've seen how hard mom and dad have worked. They've seen what a little return they're getting for that, monetarily. Okay, like don't get me wrong. There's a lot to be gained from from living on a farm and, and living that kind of lifestyle. But it is a lifestyle, you know, and it's not a lifestyle for everybody, right? But what needs to change now is that the the people that have been farming for all these years need to realize that. If the young people are going to take this over, they need to see it's viable. They need to see that this is going to give them a good life. Okay, and to some extent, it's got to be monetarily a good life, right? Because they want to see that. So how do, you, how do you do that with your farm? What products on your farm can you do value added with that's going to make it profitable? You know, um, for any of you guys that, that uh, know Moose Meadow Farms, and I went out there last night. Um, I graduated with Eloise in 1982. So it's been great to see her again, but uh, you know, being at their farm last night and seeing what they're doing out there, it's great. You know, they've got all these cool value-added things that they do. You know, um, agritourism, it's a great market. It's a great catchphrase right now. People love going to farms and doing tours and seeing what you're doing out there, right? And you know, they do birthday parties out there. They do tours. They do their, you know, sugaring off. And all, all makes money. All makes money. Everything. There's a farm in uh, Vernon called, called uh, Davison Farms. Every single thing you do on that farm costs you money. It's, an, it's a tourism farm. It's an apple orchard, basically. But they've also got like a, a pumpkin patch. I'll tell you what, that is the most expensive pumpkin I have ever bought in my life. <laughs> right? It took him... Did you get a beverage and a snack and a little story to go along with it? I had to pay for them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But so this is how they operate, right? They, so you go there to buy your pumpkin. Kids love it, right? So you get to do this tractor ride. So you ride out to the field on a tractor, right? It costs you 20 bucks or whatever it costs anyway. So you go out there, big pumpkin patch. Kids can go out there, pick their own pumpkin. Of course, they take him. It cost me 20 bucks for a pumpkin this big. <laughs> right? That's okay. It's okay. It was a good experience. And then you go back, and they've got their own little market there. Right? And they make apple pies and jellies and you name it, they're making it off the farm, which is great. They've got a kid's play area. Costs you two bucks to get in there. Everything. And you know, and I think personality-wise, chefs and farms are very similar this way, that we want to please. Right? We want to give people the experience. We just we want to give it away. I know I was talking to uh, one of my, my friend farmers you know, about doing some of this stuff. And he's like, well, but I don't want to charge for that. I'm like, you have to charge for this. You have to. If you want your kids to come and take over here, you got to start charging for this stuff, right? You have to make an experience, you know? You, you've got to look at doing this value-added stuff, okay? If you don't, I, you know, things can go along as they are, and, and that's fine, but if we're looking to the future, we really need to start looking at a farm as a viable business. And I'm sorry, guys, but farmers are not good marketers. <laughs> They're not. It does. Are to pay five and $10 yep. for the experience. Absolutely. It's all about the experience. Half of these people have never gone on to a farm. So to do a tour or mm -hmm. whatever is awesome. Yep. Yeah. And all of a sudden, 
what you mean carrots don't grow in Safeway? <laughs> but seriously, like yeah. people. But the good thing is, is that, and this is the this is the great thing for all of us in this room and at this conference, is that things are changing, and they're changing rapidly, because public awareness about the importance of what we're doing and what you guys are growing and why we need to be eating that stuff is out there. I've known five people in the last year that died from cancer. Why? Because of the shit we're putting in our bodies. And that's simple. Right? People are realizing this. Right? And it is changing. You know? And so this is the time to jump on. Right? And, and I'm going to talk to this with the chefs, about the chef's presentation later, but anybody that gets on board now is a pioneer. And that's going to help your business. Right? That's going to help you. And you need to market that. Right? Like, I'm on board with this. I'm doing this. I'm doing it now. Right? Look at me. Look what I'm doing on my farm. Got to get it out there. Yeah. Can I just make a comment that the other thing, the biggest factor is that uh, we're looking at making the next circle that I'm moving in right now is the assets. Mm -hmm. The digital organization and development. That is one of the single biggest questions that people ask is what is the asset of the origins of the yep. People want to know that, right? No. Uh, yeah, that, that's so important, right? And again, that's a marketable thing right there, right? My meat is ethically grown. And humane is Just talk to the hunters. The hunters are the best ones to tell you. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I was talking in my presentation about our, our, re our retail meat cutting program. You know, we're training now, we're training our students on 100% local carcass, antibiotic, hormone-free beef. That's all they know. Every single student that comes out of there, that's all they know, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Our customer base, okay, we have a retail meat store that we open once a week. Our customer base, that's all they'll buy. We can't even put any other meat out there now because it sits there. People, people come to our store because they know that's what they're going to get, right? That's huge. That's huge. Um, you know, we're buying more and more local lamb. We're buying more and more local pigs. We're buying more and more local chickens, okay? And people are willing to pay the price. They're willing to pay the price, you know? But again, it's, it all comes down to how you market it, right? Yeah. You know, that could be a whole day debate, but, <laughs> but it's a very good question. Um, and we've, we've talked about this for endless hours, you know, and I think what it comes down to is, you know, if I'm going to buy something from a farmer, I'm going to go to the farm. I, I want to see what they're doing out there. I want to see how they're operating, right? I mean, that's, that just makes sense. If you're going to start buying local stuff, developing these relationships, go out there and make the decision for yourself. You know, because, yeah, there are a lot of people that are, in process of being certified to be organic, but they're not there yet, right? Do they have good product? Yeah, absolutely, right? And I, and I want to support the fact that they're moving towards that way, right? And I mean, there's a whole other debate too. You know, we have some organic farmers that say, buy organic or nothing. If it's the winter time, buy organic from Mexico then. Really? Is that the best thing? Well, but their argument is, if you're, if you're, just, if you're buying local, and you're buying from a, a local farm, and that's fantastic, but they're spraying, they're, you're eating poison. Mm -hmm. But how about that truck that drives them 3,000 miles away and all these carbon emissions? Mm -hmm. How about that truck that drives with organic vegetables in it right next in the same compartment? And I know this happens because I know some truckers. Mm -hmm. Organic veg, right next to it, veg has been sprayed. Mm -hmm. I don't know the research on that, but, you know. So, you know, really it's personal choice, right? Well, I would hope that certification bodies make sure that that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you wouldn't. I mean, if, if it's labeled organic, I would hope that it is. You know. Yeah, there are yeah, the government has uh, established uh, rules uh, as well as the uh, uh, organic bodies that uh, oversee that. Uh, okay. You cannot mm -hmm. sell anything that says organic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without it really being. And there's that paper trail that can prove it. Yeah. Other than that, it's not organic. I know I have seen, you know, when I first we start, uh, started out the collaborative, there were people that were saying, yeah, my stuff's organic, but it's not certified. So if it's not certified, they can't advertise it as organic. Yeah. Wouldn't you rather come and see my farm and see that I don't use anything and trust that I grow fresh local produce mm -hmm. and, and keep me from having to go through the red tape, the bullshit I have to do a certified organic farm? Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you see the pollution that trips over those fields, I wouldn't buy it. Yeah. I'd rather see that I'm in clean, clear Yeah, and again, that personally, that's what I would do. Yeah. You know, I, I would go and see the for myself. I'm forced to have to go certified organic for you to buy it as a business. Is really well, big. it's restrictive to me, and I, I shouldn't have to go that But way. I could still buy it. I just can't put on my menu organic. I could say yeah, it's... that's fine with me. I don't want to yeah. put organic. I don't put it on my cars either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. produce and people are buying it, so. Yeah, I, I guess part of it too though is that as a chef, if I can, and I know it's a pain in the ass to get certified, but as a marketing tool, putting organic next to that on my menu is, is important. And, and you know, I'm gonna talk about this too, I might as well right now. So, you know, working with the chefs, I always make sure that I promote my farmers. You know, I make sure that on my menu, people know that I bought it from this farm. That, that this product is organic, that if it's protein, that it's hormone antibiotic free. That's all a marketing tool for me, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and so again, yeah, exactly, it is. Yeah. So cross, cross marketing. <laughs> Growing what works. So yeah, so important. Again, I'm, I'm not a farmer, so I, I couldn't tell you what's gonna work or what's not gonna work around here, but obviously it's very important to do that research before you start planting a bunch of crops that aren't gonna work, you know? Um, so protein, okay, this is a, yeah. Can, can I just comment Absolutely. on the growing what works? Uh, it's worth experimenting with non-traditional uh, foods that uh, in our northern areas here. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I've done a lot of uh, experimentation. I've grown peanuts, I've grown, hmm. well, just every cool. non-traditional thing out here and uh, they grow. Every farm is not created equal in that the, the uh, microclimate and that whether they're tucked into a, a hillside or yep. something or a river or whatever. You'd be amazed at what you can get away with if you just try. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, I think that's why as a group, as a, start talking to each other, you guys. <laughs> you know? Start going out for beers. You know, teach each other. You gotta pass this knowledge along. You know, again, you know, I talked earlier in my presentation about that. It used to be that you know there were certain chefs and that was their niche, local. There was no way they were revealing their sources or where they got their stuff from because that's how they were making their money, right? And the same I think from farmers. I'm not telling them how I grow this stuff. Like this is how I'm making my money, right? That's not going to work. We need to talk to each other. We need to educate each other. Okay. I'm just going to kind of go on here because we're running short. So protein. Protein's a very special uh, entity when it comes to selling to chefs. Uh, it's very Chefs need to be, that are going to use local protein, are going to be, they have to be at a certain skill level, okay? Because to use local protein, you need to know how to do nose to tail cookery. There's no way that, you know, I'm going to put, let's say, New York steaks on my menu, and they're going to be on the menu all year long, and that I'm going to be able to use that as a local product. It's not going to happen. How many cows am I going to have to kill <laughs> just to have a strip loin? Exactly. That's our problem. Right? Yeah, it all needs to be used. And you want the sirloin steak. And yeah. you want the T-bone steak. Yeah, good luck with that. Exactly. So, so that's where... And, and, and it's, it's one thing to grow a crop of potatoes mm -hmm. where you've got uh, a thousand pounds of potatoes with a clothesline. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you hang up a couple of beets and you've got uh, 16, 1700 pounds of beets 
the shelf life. And yeah. With the shelf life, then, and also you guys have storage facilities for this, yeah. which doesn't just come down the pipe. I mean, you can't dig a hole in the ground and put that in the ground, and you're going to come and buy it. Yeah. Yep. No, I know it's a challenge for sure. It, it's a real challenge. Um, but this is where, because of this trend now, that, that chefs are getting back to, you know, learning those skill levels. Um, and again, in smaller communities, you know, the smaller restaurants, it's going to take a while, you know. But we're starting to see it happen. You know, we certainly do it at the school, you know. But they need to get back and they need to sort of educate themselves on how am I going to use that whole animal, right? And again, there's a lot of profit in it. And that's the thing. Um, you know, I'm going to talk in my next thing about this, this about breaking down a lamb. Right, and the lamb cost me more. Or sorry, so the, let's say a whole lamb is going to cost me two hundred fifty bucks. Well, if I break it down and use it pro- properly, I can make a thousand dollars profit off that one lamb. If I use the whole thing, right? Whereas if I'm buying New Zealand lamb racks, right, they cost me a fortune first of all to buy. I can only sell them for X amount, right? But if I do the right things with a nice little lamb shank. You know, and take some of the lamb neck and shred it up and put it in a risotto, right? That's costing me next to nothing. I can sell that for 30 bucks. No problem. Because it's being creative with the food, right? Okay. So, yeah, protein, it is tough. But, again, it's all about communication, too. Because maybe there's a couple of chefs. So maybe there is the high-end guy that wants the the sirloin tips and they want the sirloin and the, the strip loin and the tenderloins. And maybe there's another guy down the street that wants lots of burger. Get them talking to each other. Get them to split the animal up, right? Again, it's all about this communication thing, right? Mm-hmm. Now, yep. in that, on, that same, on that same vein, say if we've talked about this around here a little bit, about having a central location where if we did have a shop in town mm-hmm. that the chef could shop at in the morning. Yeah. Or call in yeah, food hub. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I think... Uh, would, that, would that fly with chefs? I, th- I believe so, yeah. I mean, if we've talked about that as well as having like a central food hub, not just for protein, but for, for yeah. everything, right? Because well, um, this is one of the biggest issues with local food is distribution. Yeah. It's really tough, right? Because I know you guys don't have time to drive in five days a week, with right? 15 miles out of town, are you going to get in your vehicle and come down and buy 10 pounds of potatoes for this week? Probably not, not. right? But but again, is there any other farms around you that are doing different stuff that one vehicle could go to this farm, this farm, this farm, and this farm, and bring it into town, Yeah. right? That and again, it's that kind of communication that needs to start happening for this kind of thing to work, right? Um, But distribution is absolutely one of the biggest challenges that we've found. It's all about delivery. Yep. You can't deliver your meal unless the the produce gets delivered to you in in a reasonable time to be able to. That's right. Okay, I'm going to move on here. Mushrooms. I've seen mushrooms, I think, is a, is a good market to get into. I know as a chef, I would buy all the local mushrooms I could if I could get them supplied to me. I have uh, experienced a few people trying to start up a wild mushroom uh, business, and they haven't succeeded for whatever reasons. So, uh, cultivated, yeah. yeah. So, um, again, I, every time they've come to me, I'm, I'm excited. I'm like, yeah, if you could give me local cultivated mushrooms, I'd be in. But um, I don't know really why they failed, whether it was bad marketing, whether they just didn't get their product going, or, or what have you. So, Are there rules for establishing a budget about buying mushrooms? Like, do they have to like, just kind of, if one is growing in the basement, mm-hmm. are you going to buy some? I would. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so is there specific cleanliness that the mushrooms have to be? Uh, well, I would clean them anyway. But I mean, and again, you know, with any of your products, uh, I've got this on my list here. Make sure that you make, and part of that was about uh, convenience, right? Make the chef's life easy, okay? If he has, if he gets this, uh, let's say, box of potatoes in and they're absolutely covered in dirt and it's going to take him a half an hour extra and his aid not going to happen, you know? So make sure that the, the quality is there, sizing, consistent sizing, um, that it's clean, um, that it's absolutely the best product that you have is what you're giving to the chefs, okay? Because they're going to showcase that for you, right? You've got to make their life easy. Um, as far as regulations with mushrooms, I'm not exactly sure what the official regulations are, um, but yeah, you'd have to talk to the health department about that. 
Um, yes, convenience we just talked about. So legally, uh, so we talked about, so protein, there's a lot of regulations around protein, okay, it's got to be killed in a federally inspected plant uh, for us to be able to buy it and sell it retail. Provincially, uh, provincially yeah. 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 Um, Right, there you go. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. <laughs> Hopefully they stay closer to home. Yep. Under my friendship, uh, dealt quite a bit on, on uh, butchery. And uh, after that, all that uh, learning. Uh, you never do it again. the restaurants, we never had to break down a carcass because it was all about portion control. Every box had the same weight of T-bone or, yep. or whatever, loin chop. And the majority still are. Uh, so that skill kind of fell by the by because, we, you know, I mean, other than trim and whatnot, mm -hmm. but to care, break down a carcass, we, didn't, we never had to do that again. No, and you don't necessarily have to do that as a chef now to, to do it local because you could get it broken down into the primals from the, the butcher or whoever's doing it. They break it down into primals for you, and then you can take it down from there, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I can't do a whole side. I, I don't have that skill, right? But I could do a primal, so. Yeah. 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 Um, networking. So, with the internet, again, networking is so easy these days, okay? Again, like I said, I would, as, a, as this group or this community, start making a listserv. Get everybody's name on that listserv. So, the way that we did it, we used uh, Google Groups, okay? So, you form a group. You put the email addresses in that group so that all I have to do is send one email. So for us, it's uh, you know, TSCFC at Google Groups. As long as I'm a member, I can send it out to that. That goes out to every member in our, in our organization. So for communication, it's the way to go. Get everybody's email in one place and you can, Sorry, pardon me. Well, they need to change. I don't have access up here. Uh, well, that's that's a different story. But So what's the future of internet up here? Is that something that's going to be? So there needs to be some creative solutions for these people then, you know, and I mean, I didn't realize that that was the case up here. I mean, for us down there, it's, it's just a given, right? Yeah. What did you say that Google Groups website is? If you go onto Google and just go Google Groups, it'll come up and then what you do is you form a group. Once you form the group, then you invite members to come into that or they, or they um, send, you know, a request to be part of that group. Then once you're in there, then you just use one email address that goes out to everybody that's in that group. Sure. Um, as a market, do I have to have some type of environmental inspector for any of these or these decisions or just everything? As far as I know, vegetables don't need to be inspected. No. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> I really hope that day doesn't come. Yeah, and I mean they'll definitely get involved if you're doing any value-added stuff. There's definitely yeah, expert, yeah. There's definitely regulations around that. 
although the regulations are different if you're selling them at a farmer's market level or if you're selling them at a retail store level. It's all, there's different rules and regulations for that. Uh, so beverages, uh, we touched on a little bit, but I think that that is a market that could be tapped into for sure. You know, um, I know that uh, for our event in the summertime, that's definitely something that we're looking for next year is to have a local juice producer, you know, especially because we do have kids coming and so on. So it's not just a booze event, you know, booze and food event, although that's fun, but you know. <laughs> uh, let's see what else I have on my list here. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, they could. Yeah. Yep. Why, why be offering just pop to kids or, or apple juice? Mm -hmm. Or that's it. Yep. And, and for me, I don't do the alcoholic and I don't do the coffee and cheese. So, so you're stuck. Water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that, you know, that is an absolutely good market, marketing um, <coughs> uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. Say you have local whatever. Yep. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Even a lemon, even a lemon wedge in your in your glass of water to mask the local flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, I can smell that glass of water across yeah. the roof. I don't want yeah, it. You don't want it. No. <laughs> okay, I just want to cover a couple more things. So we only got a few minutes left. I want to talk about root cellars. Okay. I, this is something that is coming back as a chef. If I could buy root vegetables year round, I'm in. Okay, and uh, that's starting to be able to happen for us. So about four years ago, um, we do a gala dinner every year in February for uh, the foundation of the university. The theme, finally they got around to a good theme, was BC. I'm like, why did it take you this long, right? Anyway, I mean, it just makes sense. So, and, and they actually told me a year in advance it was gonna be BC. I'm like, oh, thank you guys. Thanks, you just made my life really easy. So I got to go out and start talking to farmers about, hey, what can you give me in February, right? And so I actually, um, the Sun River, or sorry, Not Shell Organics farm, I was talking to Sue and she says, well, what do you want? I said, well, what have you got? She says, well, come on out in the field, right? So we went out in the field and she had all these awesome root vegetable crops. She goes, you tell me whatever you want of these and I'll pick them and I'll sell them for you and they'll be fresh in February. I'm like, really, you'll do that for me? For 320 people? She's like, yeah. Of course I will, right? So I'm like, okay, I'll have that, that, and that, and that. That'll be wicked, right? <coughs> she knew I was gonna buy them, so she put them all away for me. February, she delivers me vegetables for 320 people that were primo, they were awesome, you know? So at that dinner, I got to go up and talk to this whole crowd of 320 uh, very rich people and say, hey guys, guess what? Everything on that plate you ate tonight, it's February, it's Kamloops, it's freezing cold, is local. And they're looking at me like, what? How's that possible, right? So I think this is an underutilized uh, uh, thing as root sellers that if, if we can get into that, and again, it's about communication with the chefs, you know, that if they're willing to buy it, you guys are gonna be willing to grow it and put it away for them, right? And there needs to be some communication and some sharing there because really if, if there's some floor, forward planning done, and that's really what kind of one of our main things is all about was forward planning and communicating with the chefs and saying, look, you know, if we are promising to buy this off you, will you grow it? Absolutely we will, you know. Um, we, you know, we've got farmers that are willing to commit whole rows. Here's your row, what do you want me to grow for you, right? And, you know, I'm gonna talk about this within the chef's presentation that, you know, that's how you make your menu different from the guy next door, you know. I've got this one potato that this farmer grows for me. He doesn't grow it for anybody else, that's our deal, right? And I'm gonna market that on my menu that this is my potato, you can't get this anywhere else in town, this makes the best french fries ever, you can only get this here, right? That's how things have to work, you know? Um, what else? Yep. Oh, are you? Cool. That's, that's awesome, that's perfect. It really does need to happen on a big scale as far as I'm concerned. Awesome. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, okay, 
chefs are negotiators. Okay? They take great pride in getting things for the most reasonable cost that they can. So when you're setting your prices, leave some room for negotiations so that they feel good about themselves at the end of the day. <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> right? It's business. It's business. Right? Everybody's looking for the best. Oh yeah. You know, because he's having a beer with this other chef buddy, you know, guess what I got this for? You know? Well you guys can go a bit of uh, yourselves, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a pardon me? It doesn't hurt to ask for a discount. No, no, it doesn't. Um, you know, and again, that's all about building that business relationship too, right? Um, we did discuss this though at the beginning when we formed our group that we told the farmers, look you guys, we want you to clearly understand we are not forming a buying group. We are not collectively going to get together and go, hey, we're going to, over all 10 chefs, we're going to buy 5,000 pounds of carrots over the course of a year, so you need to give it to us at half price because we're buying that much. That's not what we did. That's not what we're about. And we were very cautious and very clear to all the farmers that that is not what we are going to do. You know, everybody that's in our collaborative, yes, we communicate together, we work together, but we all have individual relationships with our farmers. Okay, so that's, that's important. I think that's it. Is there anything I didn't cover on here that, yep? Yeah. So buying from bulk producers, like you know, yeah, buying from it's more expensive. Uh, it depends on the season and what's what's around. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it can be anywhere from uh, protein for sure is like twice the price. You know, vegetables, you know, any 25, 30, 40 percent more. Yeah. However, you know, and again, this is going to be in my next workshop. That that can't be the only consideration. It can't be. You know, could, because when you, and this is again, this comes from the chef training his cooks, taking his cooks out to the farm, getting them to pick these vegetables, come back, prepare these vegetables, cook these vegetables. They are way less likely <coughs> to burn them, to not take care of them. They're going to use every single bit of that vegetable that they can. They're going to have the trim. They're going to make stock. You know, they're going to make sure that they take care of that because they've, they've witnessed where it came from. They don't want to kill it. Right? So they take a lot more care. Shelf life, <coughs> way longer shelf life with using local stuff. Right? So you've got that going for you. you know? um, again, getting back to the protein side of things, if I can utilize a whole lamb and make $1,000 profit off of that, I can afford to pay a little bit more for my vegetables. The other part is, is that if I market it right, I can charge more for my food on my menu if people are coming here because they know I'm serving local food I can charge more. They're coming for the taste. They're coming for the quality. They're coming for their health. Right? 